Welcome back to the Blue Door Pub Thunderdome for another bull with Andy Carlson, Minnesota's 87th best daily podcast, a show about everything and nothing. Come on, aren't you? Five days a week. Sports Jason, baby. That's how we are rolling. Tell a friend, spread the word. iTunes, Stitcher, Aha Radio, and um, uh, Twitter at Andy Carlson Show, Instagram at Andy Carlson Show, and brand new Snapchat also, creatively enough, at Andy Carlson Show. I, um, I'm trying to appeal to a younger demographic, even though I'm a 55-year-old white guy at heart. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to go young. That's what I'm doing. Uh, the Snapchat still scares me. Still working it out. Mm-hmm. That's what we're doing. We got Jake Brown, CBS Sports Radio, out in New York. He's going to be on here in a little bit. And I, I, I've been, he, he, he falls in the category of people that I've never spoken to, but I've known for years plus. Just because of social media and Twitter, and speaking of, um, you know, trying to get on social media, it, it's so cool how it can connect us, and we can have these relationships, friendships with people that we've never met, probably never would meet in real life, and it, it, it's kind of cool. I mean, as many pitfalls as social media has, the, the trolling, the terrible sexual harassment, the hate speech, etc. It, it, the positive far outweighs the negative, very, very much so. So we'll talk to Jake here in a bit. But first off, I got to tell you about the enclosed, baby. Uh, Antonia over at the enclosed, she, she's pretty awesome. She's taking care of us. And I'm pretty excited because the missus has no idea that she has a personalized, much to my preferences, pair of knickers coming her way and here's what you do it's a panties delivery service the world's finest and you go through preferences picked one three nine 12 months like i did get some more savings and you get and then delivered right to your door personalized gift as well and month after month after month of just awesomeness Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i got my first shipment coming uh later in the week and uh if you use the code PFTW, as a purple FTW, my other side hustle, PFTW, you get 15 bucks off any order that you put in. 15 bucks off. How can you lose? PFTW at the enclosed.com, the world's finest panties delivered right to your door. The enclosed.com, code PFTW. Hit it up. All right, let's get Jake Brown up in here. Just your job. And coming into the Blue Door Pub Thunderdome is Jake Brown. Follow him on Twitter at Drake, Jake Brown Radio, ZBS Sports Radio out in New York. Hey, what's going on, man? It's good to uh, finally talk to the famous uh, Andy Carlson. <laughs> it, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I was just pontificating in the intro of how awesome social media can be. Because like, we've known each other for years. This is the first time we've ever spoken. That's that's the world of the internet. It's yeah. weird. I mean, whether it's Twitter, it's it's like Tinder, whatever it may be. Yeah. Uh, you could go so so long to talking to someone without actually talking to them, but now uh, it is finally happening. Now, speaking of Tinder, since you you brought a, a, up, we'll go down that <laughs> rabbit hole. Uh, are you so you're young? Are are you single? I'm 26. I'm single. Yep, on dating apps and all that. All right. So you're telling me that you're 26. You're single. You're in New York, and you're just smashing Tinder. Uh, I mean, th- that is kind of living the dream. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Tinder actually doesn't work that great. It's more other apps. I'm not going to go into all the apps or whatever. But I mean, I've gone. My, I'm actually going to date uh, to the Mets game tonight. So I, I uh, it, it's it, the thing is the problem with dates. And it's just it gets so expensive when you're doing all these dates, and it's just mm-hmm. it, a weekly thing. It's like there's yeah. a time has to come where I don't want to be single just for the sake of my wallet. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, I'm just trying to just trying to be young as long as I can, uh, as my hair has already faded away. Hey, uh, I'm not gonna lie. That was one of the the main things that was appealing uh, to, uh, about my wife when I was dating her because she is the most frugal human on earth. I'm like, oh baby, mm-hmm. come to daddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean that's. That's a winner. As soon as you find that, it's, you got to lock it up. Now, like, like most friends and family, when they hear that you work in sports, I'm, uh, I, I get this. I'm sure you get this. Like, oh, can you hook me with some tickets? Don't you get to go to all the games for free? Yeah, I mean, I get asked daily from, from people, can you hook me up? Can I come to the show? This, that. Mm. And you just got to learn to say no a lot of times. Um, I don't get all games free. I mean, I pay for 
a decent amount. I mean, I sometimes get free concerts, events, games, but it's not everything is free. I mean, it's, I'm not at that point yet in my career I hope to get there uh, within five or ten years, but I'm at the point where it's like, oh, everything's free. And then in the end, when you go to games, it's not even about the tickets. If the mm. tickets are free, whatever, you're still paying for beer and food, which ends yeah. up being ten times more than what the tickets are. Yeah, you're not quite tiki and or tourney yet. No, I haven't reached that level. I, I didn't rush for thousands of yards in the NFL, so I got well, a while. That's right. You know, he he rushed for thousands of yards. He fixed his fumbling problem. He didn't get a ring, and then he badmouthed Eli out the door. It's all good. Oh man, I can't talk smack about it, Tiki. That's my guy. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah so I'm, I'm going to plead the fifth on that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's right. Just that's how that's what usually happens. I'll say something that could be antagonistic uh, if it came from the guest mouth, and then they'll just be silent. So. That's how it usually goes. Yeah, you, usually I'll be down <laughs> to talk smack on someone, but I, since I've met and known Tiki for a little bit now, yeah. uh, he's, he's he's a really cool dude. And obviously he had the fumbling problems. He retired mm. too early, didn't get a ring. I mean, he has all those knocks. But as a person, he is a good guy, so I'll and, leave it at that. You know who's a real tool? <laughs> that Rondé bar. No, just kidding. Uh, Jake, <laughs> all right, so let's backtrack a little bit. Like, What's your story? What's uh, how, How'd you get started in sports radio? Um, I've always known since I was young that I wanted – to be a sports radio host, broadcaster. I used to, I mean, at bar mitzvahs, parties, whatever it may be, I'd be with the old guys talking the game. I'd be talking about Clyde Frazier. I'd be talking about Tom Seaver. And I've always just loved the history of the sport. I love the teams. I was a diehard. Uh, I was actually a Yankee fan at first and switched to the Mets, but the Mets were really my first true love mm-hmm. and will always be the original Bay, as they say today. It'll be Bay. The, the Mets uh, have always been there oh. despite their – Constant losing season. So, I mean, I used to sit down and call games. And when I call and watch the game, pretend to be Gary Cohen, mm-hmm. Howie Rose, whoever. And I, I always wanted to talk sports. I would come home from uh, school, and the first thing I would do is turn on Yes Network and watch Mike and the Mad Dogs. So I, I, I was just trying to learn and pick up what they did to make myself get better as I got older because I knew – I could not sit behind a desk, and I do sit behind a desk during the day working <laughs> in digital. Yeah. Um, but for my life, I just can't sit behind a desk and not do something I love. So I, I just knew probably when I was seven or eight, really young, that I wanted to, what I wanted to do, and I'm still chasing it today and partly doing it as well. Um, so, I mean, I mean, you know how the industry, it's a grind, and it, it does get frustrating. But, I mean, I think the key is really – trying to push through and, and believe in yourself and believe in what your you set your vision to be. Yeah, a- absolutely. And it, it, it's funny. It's so cool how technology and social media has played a part in it where you can, you know, you, you do what I do. I mean, you do podcasts, you get guests on, uh, you, you talk, you put it on wax and you put it out there to the people and you can build up a decent sized audience in a spot where, you know, back in the day, if you're trying to get into sports radio, you were taking the, the graveyard shift. Hey, c- can I get an hour from 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. on the a.m. station trying to break in? But no, you can get reps in uh, through podcasts nowadays. Yeah, and, and I think, and what I've, done and have done for a while is that you're to buy airtime. A lot of people don't realize well, I was hosting an ESPN radio in New Hampshire for a year. That was bought airtime. Luckily, mm-hmm. I had someone paying for it at the time, but uh, people have to really pay to be on the air. You have to invest in yourself in radio. Um, even with podcasts, you have to invest in equipment, uploading, whatever, SoundCloud, for yep. the unlimited monthly. I mean, there's so many things that go around. If you want to build a following, sometimes people buy followers, stuff like that. So there's so much that goes into uh, the back end of it for you to get to the next step that if you're not willing to invest in yourself, you might as well just quit now. So, I mean, mm-hmm. I've used so much money in investing in myself because I believe in the long run it's going to pay off. And I, and I think soon it will. Um, but yeah, podcast, it's like you, your, your mother, your sister, your brother, your dog is everyone's bringing up podcasts to the table. So the key is just bringing content that's fresh and something different. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to find that. And everyone asks me, I'm sure you get this too, like, I, I want to do what you do. I want to start a podcast. I want to get going. I'm like, well, you should probably put in about 50 hours of just talking, and they're all going to suck, and no one's going to listen to them, but you're going to take that kick in the nuts, and you're going to get better. And then eventually, after 50, 100, 200 hours, you'll actually sound somewhat competent, but probably not really, but just keep going. Yeah, and I mean, I've had so many episodes where it's probably just my like mom and dad listening in the mm. radio shows where it's literally nobody listening. But the thing is, and I've I've said this to a lot of people who 
are trying to get started or have done stuff, I say, pretend that you are hosting a drive time show. Put it on your all. Pretend that there's millions listening, even if it's negative seven people listening. No one's listening. Mm-hmm. It. Just pretend uh, that everyone is. Because if, if you're pretending, if, if you're treating it as the four listeners, you're going to sound like trash and you're going to have no energy and there's going to be nothing there. So I've always, since day one, just pretended like, hey, I'm, Mike, I'm in Mike Francis's seat. Mm. Let me host a show like that. And I mean, it, it's a growing problem. You said, like, you have to put a ton of hours in and practice. And even sometimes now I'm rusty. When you do a show like once a week and you have a week off, you're rusty because you weren't keeping yourself fresh that week. So uh, that's why I hate if I have to miss a week of shows, like when I was on vacation and then the flight got killed, I was pissed because I was doing a week without a show. Mm-hmm. So to me, I've, I've tried to every week at least get one or two shows where I'm talking and doing rants to keep fresh because the time away from it, every, any week loss is a week of time, really. It's, it's not, you're not moving forward when you have a week vacation. So I, that's a big reason, honestly, people say, why don't you travel that much take vacation? One, off money. Two, is I don't like missing doing a show or, or miss a, a week at a, a guest who could be in studio. So it's, it's a grind. I mean, it's you got to put a ton of time and effort into it. And people think they're on blog talk radio and they're going to mm-hmm. be the next Mike Francesa a year later uh, and need to uh, – I don't know what they're smoking, but they need to put a lot more work into that. I don't know what they're smoking, but I want some. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned Mike Francesa's chair. Uh, I bet you that thing smells like like Vicks vapor rub and Diet Coke farts. Well, his, uh, it's still a mystery the Diet Coke thing because my friend interned there, and he said that there was a time where he had to get drinks, and he was getting him a Coke. So that's mm-hmm. still a big mystery. I, I think it is Diet Coke. Yeah. But he had told me one time that he was getting Coke, so it makes me wonder. But, yeah, um, I've sat in that seat and took a picture once, and uh, I don't think I ever washed my ass again. So, <laughs> uh, so that that explains why you have the cubicle on the floor that no one goes to. I get it. Now. Exactly. Yeah. Now, <laughs> so with Francesa, Obviously, you know, one of the godfathers of sports talk radio, uh, being outside of the New York market and also being a little bit younger, uh, I, I definitely miss the heyday. Uh, a, a lot of times, Francesa is uh, a bit of a punchline, especially on Deadspin and uh, so the, sort of the cool kid crowd. But w- when you were growing up, like what hit it off with you, Francesa and the Mad Dog? The show was just so cool. I mean, it wasn't based around guests. It was just them going back and forth. And them having different opinions and, mm. and callers just saying, I mean, the callers now kind of make the show because yeah. Francesca likes to revolve the show a lot around callers and calling people out. You got Mike from Montclair calling every week and just uh, great rants or he mispronounced. And that's a lot of stuff. It's like content driven where if it's like he, he couldn't, like last week, couldn't pronounce on Takupo to, to that I can't even pronounce either. Um, that goes viral. I think their chemistry was just so good and they both were so passionate um and when they would argue there was nothing better i mean people love debate and that's why first take became so popular Mm because debate that's what mike and the mad dog did every day and then you had different elements of it where they would go on site they they had the the um the super bowl trivia contest was incredible every year that was like everyone's favorite part of the year where mad dog would dress up he'd wear the gray wig the trivia so there were different things throughout the year that made it special and then the reunion recently that I was at a couple of years ago at Raven City. Now they're gonna have a thirty for thirty documentary coming in July. Oh, yeah. So it was really just an I- iconic sports talk radio show and a lot of it's we it's weird because I've done a lot of my podcasts have been co hosts and like this is the first show where I really podcast that I can do my own thing. Um but a lot of people how you make it is having someone else in a bigger name. Mm-hmm. And I think that was an example of that um of that, those two guys working together. Do you prefer going solo, doing your own thing, or do you like working with a partner? Uh, it's tough to say because I like doing my own thing because I think the co-hosts I've had just have not been as into it or worked as hard as I have. I hate to take shots, but it's just a fact um, that the people I've done shows with just weren't there as much. Like we both. I had certain expertise and they had something else and they just didn't put in the time and effort. I mean, I've put so much effort into this because I want it more than a lot of other people want it. And I want it more than the people I've done shows with. So I I don't think I've found the right co-host and I would love to find one right 
right uh one day and i haven't had a big name co-host like mm-hmm. a, you know like a bart scott whoever it may be who's in media um who can make it work so i have not found the right co-host so i'd say i do like it better myself because i'd rather the pressure on me in terms of getting guests it's definitely better having a co-host who is well connected mm-hmm. um because th- there were times that i with like the last show uh, where my co-host knew some people, new publicists that helped us get guests. So in terms of guests, sometimes it's better having a co-host for me so far. But in terms of quality of the show, I think I've been better off on my own. Uh, oh, I-, I have the perfect co-host for you. She just became available, Lala Anthony. <laughs> uh, I'll have to make sure that's sponsored by Honey Nut Cheerios first. Yeah, well, I mean, she has media experience. That'd be perfect. Yeah, uh, She's 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 big time. I don't know. I don't know if I could steal Mel's girl like that because once once she starts talking to the JB Thunder, it's it's game over, and then we'll be <laughs> we'll be wiped up pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> who's been your favorite interview so far? Who? Oh, that's that's a tough one. My favorite interview. The most nervous I was, was for French Montana and DJ Khaled, mm. um, because Khaled it was during the summer and he was just at the time it was I kind of learned. I mean the guy was. Very, I mean, he's not super talented, but the guy was super famous yeah. uh, when he took over Snapchat, and then he's just gotten to the point where it's gotten kind of annoying. Um, French is a rapper I love, so that was that mm-hmm. one I was nervous for. Uh, it's tough to say because some of the the great ones are really phoners. Like when we interviewed Mark Cuban, that was one of my favorites just because that was an awesome interview. Dr. Ben Carson was a cool one, mm-hmm. and then he said the dumb thing that he said that blew up and went viral, so... Tamaki Walker. Oh, that, that, was, that was on your show. I, wow, that was it, wasn't it? Yeah, that that was ours, yeah, where he uh, told the sucker punch story of Kobe. <laughs> yeah. um, it was the lead story on TMZ that day. That was a wild day. Um, but in terms of in person, I don't. I, that's, I guess in terms of biggest name, it's Callan and French. Mm. Um, who, who's my favorite? That is, that's a great question. Um, Give me some time to think, and I'll maybe yeah. give an answer later. But uh, those those two are my favorite in terms of guys that I love, and like mid music, and in terms of like fame. Uh, I I guess I'd say Khaled of French. I, I love DJ Khaled because, like you said, he he has no discernible talent, but he he's super famous, and and everyone loves the shit out of him. It's like, oh yeah, he he hacked marketing. Yeah, I mean, what he he basically is was the king of Snapchat, and now it, I mean it's gotten kind of ridiculous with Assad Khaled, and he, mm. he comments on Assad's pictures that he just posted. I mean, it's kind of I can't really say too much because I'll retweet Jake Brown from Jake Brown Show, and I'll retweet both accounts. But it's just <laughs> funny that he's posting as a baby. I mean, I guess it is great marketing, but mm. it, it gets to the point of all right, calm down, let Assad live a little bit. I mean, I yeah. think Assad by the age of like six is gonna hate his dad. Uh, random uh, aside, uh, so Straight Out Compton, I, I, I love the movie. I, I know a lot of the backstory. It, I, I was fully into it, invested in this this universe, right? Except until they introduced Suge Knight, I'm like, why did they cast someone uh, DJ Khaled's body double? <laughs> it's like, no, Suge Knight is that supposed was a great to be movie. Suge Knight was this former defensive tackle, imposing like badass mf'er, and then you got a guy who looks like DJ Khaled. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Maybe you should have been the casting director for that. Yeah, I know. It's like, man, we couldn't we couldn't get like, I don't know, John Henderson or Linval Joseph. I mean, come on, Linval Joseph. Wow, that, that is a name right there. Yeah, there it's go. a name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we appreciate you um, um, letting him go. Uh, we greatly enjoy him here in Minnesota. Yeah, I mean, you guys have other concerns, and it starts with uh, Will the ball game. Uh, be be good again this year. Will he be back? Will he be healthy? Yeah, uh, there's a there's a civil war going on right now between Team Bradford and Team Teddy. I I, I don't really know. Like I, I'm fully on Team Teddy, but I honestly don't think he's going to play this year. Yeah, don't be on Team Bradford, bro. Don't be that guy. <laughs> you know he's not going to. He won't last another year and play well. I mean, he's going to be interception city. Well, that and it's like. Bradford is like the safe choice. It's like uh, every team is grasping for 
the franchise quarterback. I mean, l- look at your Jets. They're, they're still the, – hell, they might even draft a quarterback at six or even move up. And then that's after taking Hackenberg in the second last year. So it, it's like once you get a hold of a, a top 15 guy, like Bradford's probably the 15th best quarterback in the league, you're just like – I don't know if I want to let him go. I don't know if I want to chance it. This might be the best we can do. Maybe we should settle. It, it, it's like that chick who you know used to be super hot, but now she's in her late thirties and she's got a guy who's bald, maybe a little bit chubby, but he makes some decent money. Maybe it's time to settle. You, you just described me in my late thirties. I mean, bald, chubby, <laughs> and hopefully have some money. So yeah. thanks for that. <laughs> no, it, it, it's but right. No, I, on the Jets' point, you said Hackenberg might be the worst pick in Jets history. The fact Oof. that they picked that knucklehead in the second yeah. round is an absolute joke. The guy couldn't play one single game on a team that it, it went four and twelve. I mean, that says mm. all you need to hear about him. He is a middle school quarterback, and I I want the Jets to pick Watson. I know people are going to nay say he turned it over. Uh, he has a downside to him, but the guy's a winner. He's won a title. He played throughout all of his years at college. I'd rather have an older quarterback that's won a championship than a Trubinsky who's played like 13 games. Yeah, and all right, so you're going to put Hackenberg above Vernon Golston. Well, uh, that's a good point. But, I mean, Golston, at least we saw play a little bit. I mean, yeah. had a sack in his career. I don't know if we'll ever see Hackenberg. Would you take Petty over Hackenberg? Oh, yeah. I think Petty, I didn't hate the pick because I think he was a really good college quarterback. Mm. I just don't think he's ready yet, um, and I would not play him next year, uh, this year coming up. Um, I think they have to pick – I've heard maybe a safety or a corner or the tight end out of Bama, but I just – I think – this. I wouldn't wait another year. I mean, the whole thing is this is the rebuild year to maybe be a winning team next year. If you wait another year to pick a franchise quarterback – you're delaying this rebuild another three or four years versus uh, one to two years. Uh, since we're on the Jets, g- give me a percentage chance for 2018 that McCagnan and Bowles will both be back. I think hmm. – well, I think here's the thing. They look like they're in just complete rebuild mode. They mm-hmm. get, did nothing in free agency. Their roster is not very good. And I think they're expecting going four and twelve. So I honestly think, I think McCagnan will definitely be back because I don't think he's done a terrible job. I think that team underachieved last year. So I think I'd say at eighty percent, uh, he will be back for twenty eighteen. And I'll say fifty fifty, or I'll say fifty five percent chance Bowles is back just because I think mm-hmm. the expectation has to be low. With I mean, you look at them on paper, and they are nowhere near a playoff team, even if they have a. I mean, even if you give them an A-plus draft grade, they're still not near a playoff team. Yeah, and uh, I think it might be for McCagnan, who it, it annoys the shit out of me that he doesn't capitalize that second C in his name, but I digress. It, um, it, it's almost like a, he, he could save himself if he drafts a quarterback at six or trades up to get a quarterback because that buys him a, a kind of a scholarship here. But uh, I don't know, man. Like, like Watson's decent, but if you're fully going to tank, Go and tank and get Darnold or Rosen or the kid from Wyoming next year. Just completely like go go for one in fifteen. Yeah, I, I think another option if he's not gone is maybe trade back and get Mahomes. I mean, I've heard great oh. things about this kid. I think he's yeah. represented by uh, by uh, Lee Steinberg. Mm-hmm. So I think I, I would take a shot maybe at him. He's big. He's got a body. I, he could be a franchise quarterback. So maybe wait a little bit and get him. Yeah. Um, yeah, I hear what you're saying about. I mean, everyone's saying Darnold's going to be incredible next year, and just to wait, tank and wait for him. But even if you do tank, are you going to tank enough to be that first pick? Because we mm. know there are teams that are worse than the Jets in the NFL. So there's no guarantee that next year you're going to be so bad that you'll have a chance at getting Darnold or Rosen. Yeah, I I, I love the Mahomes pick. Like honestly. I, I'm when it's not my team. I re, I'm really big in just the the YOLO type player, and that that's what Mahomes is. Like, there's a reason why he he keeps getting comp to Brett Favre. So, you know, if I'm the Jets, hell, just take Mahomes at six and just be like, all right, uh, we're gonna be bad, but kid, <laughs> kid, you're gonna just go out there and sling it all over the yard. I like you saying YOLO type player. That is a new description for a guy, and I appreciate that. Oh yeah, um, and I appreciate anything Drake. As I'm a huge Drake fan, but. Yeah, I, I, I don't think they're going to six, but I think they could trade maybe to down to 20 or 25 and still get him. Mm. I think the Browns, honestly, 
they trade back at some I mean, they keep the first pick, but then the, I, I think they have the 12th pick, too. They maybe trade down and get him. I don't see why the Browns wouldn't get a quarterback early, considering they don't have one, unless they think Cody Kessler is their future. Mm. Now, who's the one pick that would just piss you off? Like, say the Jets stood pat, and then they, they took it six. Like, who, who would piss you off? Probably Trubinsky. I don't think he's anywhere <laughs> near ready. And I think it would just be another waste of a quarterback pick. I mean, you couldn't get worse, much worse than Hackenberg. Trubinsky, and it bothers me when guys are have so many question marks yet are floating around as a potential first pick in the draft. I mean, it's like, why? I mean, why? The Browns, it makes no sense to pick him. I mean, there's a couple experts here and there that are saying, uh, mock their mock draft, their 37th mock draft in the last mm-hmm. 31 days, that Trubinsky can go one. And I think any guy that has red flags and just doesn't have experience, I shy away from Saul. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd be pretty pissed if the Jets took him. Ooh, what if they took Fournette? I like Fournette. I think mm-hmm. that's a good pick. I just don't think running backs need. Now, if he's the best player available, um, I take him. I, I would take him over the corner uh, and over the safety out of LSU. I would take Fournette. So I, mm-hmm. I think the guy has the chance to maybe be Adrian Peterson 2.0. So I, I would be very happy with Fournette. Uh, ooh, the second coming of the two down tyrant. Yeah, great memories from Adrian Peterson. No, not really. <laughs> Tor- the, torn ACLs left and right. Ah, that's too that's uh too soon to throw Adrian Peterson's name out there. I forgot yeah. you're over there in Minnesota. No, no, it's there. It's like uh, we're glad he's gone. He should have gone two years earlier. That's how we roll, though. The um, uh, I, I'm kind of miffed that they keep moving the draft now. Like I still think it New York Radio City Music Hall. Like there's an energy about that. Like I, I'm not psyched about Philly. You're appreciative of the choir. I work across the street from Radio City Music Hall, so I'm easily in the building. Uh, would be every year. I mean, I I went the year of Manziel, and it was awesome. I don't see why the country Philly. It's like, come on, like I don't want to hate on Philly, but I mean, it's trash. So it, it, besides Philly cheesesteak, I mean, the, the fans do snowball at Santa Claus. Give me yeah. a break. So I don't. I, I agree. Radio City. I mean, I literally walk four feet and I'm there. So it's the easiest commute for me yeah. uh, ever. And, and I think the the draft is starting to see it with um, you know, invitees turning down invites. And, like, you know, there was uh, some glitz and glamour to New York, Manhattan, Radio City Music Hall. You know, not so much wherever they're doing in Philly or if they're doing Kansas City next year. It's just not there. Is it going to be in Kansas City next year? Uh, they're in the mix. Yeah, I know that Green Bay wants to host it too. I'm just like, no one's going to go to freaking Northeast Wisconsin. How about you? Let's just take a flight to Sweden while we're at it. I mean, yeah. come on now. I mean, just keep it in the Mecca. Yeah. Well, NFL is to keep trying to grow the name inter- game internationally. Let's put it in Alberta. I don't even know where that is. Where's uh, Alberta? I know, Canada somewhere. Um, oh, oh. So w- when you were a kid, did you ever go down for the draft and like boo Kyle Brady? Did I boo who? Uh, like all all the Jets picks. You know the Jets were Jets fans are famous for just booing uh, all their first round picks in the draft. No, I, I've only been to uh, one NFL draft, one or uh, one NFL draft. I've been to a couple NBA drafts, but I'm I'm not the person really that goes and boos a guy before they. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, I, I was there for the Porzingis yeah. year, but I was media, so I wasn't booing. Obviously, mm-hmm. I wasn't happy like most Knicks fans were, and then obviously we were wrong on that one. Yeah. Uh, what is going to be the plan with the Knicks? Like, is Phil Jackson actually going to be the guy, or is he just the clown show? Problem is, I don't think they're going to get rid of him, and they just picked up his contract, so he's got twenty-four million reasons why he's staying. Because why wouldn't he collect that money? I think this is the summer that will tell. What can Phil Jackson do? I, you look at last off season and you think, on paper, the Knicks were a playoff team. I mm-hmm. think there were a lot of chemistry issues, and there were some pieces that didn't go in place in the triangle, and a very interesting coaching hire, Jeff Hornacek, where it made you scratch your head a little bit. But in the end, we thought the Knicks were a playoff team, so I think they dramatically mm-hmm. underachieved. And I think what he said about Melo is wrong, and I personally like Melo, but... I do think this team is probably better off in a direction of getting rid of him, but they are just, it's just so much issues that Phil has caused in terms of one, not speaking for most of the season Two, when he does speak, it's never anything good. Mm. It's stupid. It's idiotic. And now the, the new face of your franchise, once Melo's gone now, because now this 
uh, breakup with Lala and allegedly uh, impregnating a stripper is completely ending his time. New York, I think the face of your franchise is unhappy. Porzingis did not show up to the exit meetings, and who knows where his head's at right now. So I think there's a lot that needs to be repaired this summer, and it's probably too much to get the Knicks anywhere near the playoffs next year. And this is going to be a couple of years till the Knicks are even talked about for seven or eight seed, unless there's some sort of miraculous off season and somehow they get a first round pick for Mello. Mm-hmm. There's so many crazy things that have to go in place for the Knicks to not be a couple of years behind now. Well, you know, Porzingis seems unhappy, so Phil should probably just trade him, and uh, we'll, we'll give you Andrew Wiggins, and then uh, we'll, we'll call it good. I don't. That's actually not even a bad offer. I mean, I, I would take Andrew Wiggins. Yeah. I don't think he's a bad player. Yeah, he's um, he he's got talent. I don't think he fits what Tibbs wants to do exactly. And also, I think him and Levine are sort of skill redundant. And uh, I think Levine ha- has a chance to be a special player. I feel like Wiggins is a little tapped out already. Yeah, but I mean, the guy's so young. Remember, he's like what twenty years old, twenty one. Yeah. Give him a couple of years. Um, to develop a little bit here. It's a little early. Yeah, th- that's sort of what's annoying about basketball. Is like none of these guys get good until they're 24, but they're in the league at 19. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I, I think guys should have to stay at least a couple years at college, but I don't. I don't see them changing. They already changed them once, so you have to play a year. Um, I don't know. It's. It's. I, I think guys should, if they're not going to go to college, have to play a couple years overseas so you could play at a professional level. Um, we see a guy like Wiggins getting here so early. They have so much room to grow. And these guys come in, they're so weak. I mean, Porzingis got here and he had no muscle. Mm. Uh, so something's got to change with the, the training regimen. Like, uh, re, re, is it regime? Re, res, regiment? Uh, regiment, the word? Red, re, re, uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> oh, I know the regiment's uh, like a military. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, something's got to change with these guys. got to bulk up. Porzingis, yeah. even, he's got to bulk up so he could be a post up player. And so we can play 82 games. So, yeah, give Wiggins a little time. I think you're being a little hard. Now, th- this might be just European and especially Russian stereotypes, but I feel like athletes from over there are either rail thin, like Porzingis, like Dirk was, or just completely beefed out, deadlifting 3,000 pounds, and that's just the women. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think uh, too many guys over there, but they don't play defense. So all they're w- worried about is scoring uh, over in Europe. So you can see why they're really in the weight room because most of those places don't really preach defense. Oh, like, that's just uh, like AAU over here. Over here. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what's your take on the the uh, what's the idiot's name? Oh, Le- Levar Ball. Oh, you had to bring up this guy. I mean, we're giving him <laughs> more attention than he deserves already. Uh, I think he needs to shut up, and I think he needs to realize that because your career was a failure in sports, trying to become Kim Kardashian in father figure form Mm -hmm. makes everybody in the world hate you. So while he may have cashed out some checks because of this, and he's, he's become a household name, it's not a good kind of household name. Now, sadly, there are people... I love the Kardashian family. I freaking hate that family. There's mm. no talent. The fact that we give them all the attention and the money in the world is truly depressing when we're just out here trying to pay rent and putting out good content. Yeah. Uh, they're out here trying to um, buy a house that's over $100 million. So I think that LeVar is a head case, and I think just for the best for Lonzo to quiet down, the fact that LeVar is more of a household name now than Lonzo Mm-hmm. I mean, that tells you all you need to know, really. And we have built up a society where it's all about attention and all publicity is good publicity. But there is something to be said. And I think that Skip Bayless uh, embodies this to a degree. Like, if 100% of the population, if 10% loves you and 90% hates you, that's better than a certain percentage having no opinion on you at all. Like, it's almost better that people are aware of you and hate you. Oh yeah, because the cash do checks. I mean, look at yeah. look at the cash me outside. How about that girl? Like, oh god, she's, six, she's got six figures now on a reality show coming. Yeah. And I mean, she said one little stupid phrase on Doctor Phil, and then she goes out and says like, "I made your show." Mm-hmm. I mean, Doctor Phil makes uh, like nine figures, so yeah. she needs to relax. And she's thirteen, so everyone feels 
uh, entitled when people do hate them and they're cashing out checks. And I don't know, it's a sad generation we live in, even with women. The women have become basic. And now, with these like circling back to where we are with dating apps, like there's so many options out there. And women are getting so much attention that they feel the need to treat most of the dudes like trash because they, they have a couple of years and they're that are bad. So, I mean, it goes back to that. So it's a, it's really a sad generation, millennial generation that we live in that I'm sadly a part of. Uh, uh, yeah. Also, you know, it's sad. You mentioned the, the cash me outside girl. Uh, when I first saw that clip, uh, I was watching it uh, on YouTube with my wife. I was like, wow, she's kind of hot. And then she's like, you know, she's 13, right? I'm like, Oh shit. Never mind. I'm, I'm not even gonna lie. I saw the same thing. I was yeah. shocked that she's 13 because she looks at least 18. Uh, yeah. And then once you hit 13, you basically just have to say nothing else from that point and just move on to another well, subject. What was the Chris Locke had a had a line? It's like if she looks, uh, if she says she's 26 and looks 26, she's 12. If she says she's 26 and looks 26, she's damn near 40. Oh, don't tell Kodak Black that because as long as they're twelve, <laughs> Kodak Black is like a is like the Fisher Price mm. um, notice on, that come on toys. He says, "Oh, six and up." All right, I'm good. That's that's Kodak Black. Oh. I don't know if he's a I don't know if you know he's a rapper and she mm. was in his music video. And they, I'm pretty sure um, that they may have done some stuff, which is I mean it's obviously illegal, but I mean Kodak Black just didn't care. I mean Tyga yeah. as well, he didn't care. Uh, so. I, I feel like rappers like there's a different set of rules for rappers. Especially if you like him. Yeah, I think Kodak Black is terrible, so I, I don't really, yeah. I, I think it's ridiculous. Um, and the fact that he would do that is kind of, I mean, we don't, listen, I don't know that he actually has, but that's what rumors have said, mm-hmm. and he's paying her to be in a music video. So it definitely uh, is a little bit shady. Now, is it libel or slander when we say it? Because I, I, I always get the two mixed up. Uh... I think it's libel, <laughs> but that's why I throw the word allegedly. So yeah. it makes it so you basically you can't sue or do anything if you say alleged. Uh, I'll just say allegedly yeah. Kodak Black is doing yeah, something. Yeah, I, I love it. Cash you, me outside. If you just put the allegedly in there, it's like a no, no disrespect or I, I, I love person X, but they're a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, it's it's putting a band aid on yeah. the situation. Uh, Jake, a couple more questions, and uh, I'll get a hair for the day. Um, so New York. Could, could you ever see yourself leaving the New York market, or are you you the city through and through? Uh, leaving, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm trying to host the actual radio show full time in 2017. I think I'm ready. I think I'm good enough. I think I put the time in with podcasts and with uh, like local radio weekly programs or whatever with radio um, that I'm ready. And I think I have to leave. There's no way I'm going to at 26 start a WFN if I if I do then I'd be a living legend because that's almost impossible to do. So I think I'm going to have to move and I'm, I'm ready. The question is where, and who, the whole thing is who's going to take a chance on you. And that's, that's mm. the position I'm in. Who's what program director is going to say, you know what, I'm going to give this 26 year old a shot. Let's see if it pays mm-hmm. off. That's going to be the person that I think is going to be a rich man. Cause I think I'm ready to take to the next level. And if I have a support group around me, it's only going to be better. We're in a position where we're doing so much ourselves, producing books, doing social media, writing articles, doing all this stuff, where if you have a good team around you, there's so much weight off your shoulders that allows you to actually hone your craft and be great. Um, and I think that I really would like to go to like a Florida, California. Obviously, I don't. I honestly don't think I'm in a position where I need to go to Montana or Iowa to do a show. I think I'm going to get more recognition doing my podcast in New York versus going to that smaller market. I think I could go to a, a mid mid major kind of market um, and I'm ready. And it's, it's a tough decision that people have to face in this industry is do you want to leave home and do you want to go elsewhere to pursue your dreams for one less money two for maybe less, less friends, three, a different life uh, and four, maybe not the most comfortable city that you're in because you don't know the teams as well as I do New York teams. So there's a lot of, and there's a thousand other questions you got to ask. So it's going to be a decision. I, I strongly hope and believe that I will face this year. Um, but I mean, I'm ready for it. And I, I hope uh, someone will bring me on board because it'll be a great decision if they do. So this time next year, 105.3 Paducah, Kentucky, the Jake Brown show. 
Kentucky. I mean, I, I mean, I guess the chicken is good there. But hey, hey, hey caller, who, who I, we got? I guess you have to do it. Jake, I, Jake, I don't like your take on the Wildcats. You know the Calipari <laughs> is gone down here. Yeah, see, that's the thing. Down south, it's so different in terms of it. One, college trumps pro sports for a yeah. lot of those cities. Two, they love they talk NASCAR. Now, if I have to talk NASCAR, um, I don't think it's going to go too well. So that's also a different thing. When you have to move, you have to think about the cultural differences. I lived in North Carolina. My family lives down there. It's a completely different life. Mm-hmm. I see myself doing a show in Charlotte because there's enough sports teams there. Um, but say you're doing a show in South Carolina, you're talking about the Gamecocks, you're talking about the the cattle around the corner. Um, it, it's just a completely different atmosphere. So I, that's definitely going to be something that's – I think that's part of the challenge of the industry is, is getting that challenge of, hey, I'm going to do a show where there is no pro sports team and where I have to talk college sports. And, it's, and what bothers me, something that bothers me is a lot of program directors will think, oh, you don't know Cleveland sports, you can't be here. It's <laughs> like there is a thing called the Internet where I can research and dedicate hours and hours a day to know what I'm talking about. I, I'm not going to have the pulse of that fan, but it's it's something we can easily learn, and that's what's so great about the Internet is that we could figure all this stuff out. So I, I, don't, I don't buy into the notion of, oh, you're not from that city, you can't be a host guy, and that's something that does bother me. Yeah, and also, I, I think it is good to have fresh eyes of someone who's knowledgeable about the sport can have a quasi-objective take on the team that you know, maybe is running against the grain of the, the local listeners, and all of a sudden you got ratings like, who is this jabroni from New York coming in and talking about my Tennessee Titans? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's good to have an outside non-homer perspective. I'm not saying mm-hmm. all these hosts are homers. But it, it's good, and it, it'll, as you're right, it'll bring up to spark debate. And I think that's something that more stations do need because I'm seeing a lot of these stations with older talent that's from that city. Mm. It's time to get young. It's time to get fresh. And it, it's us millennials. I hate to keep saying that word, but uh, with the power that we use social media, I mean, I've had to promote myself and my brand and all that myself. Like, I haven't had support of a lot of other people. And I think if I'm given a bigger platform, that's only going to work wonders. So, yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's time to start these stations start getting younger. And I think when people start do retire, like when a Francesca retires and mm. and Bernstein in Chicago and so, guys, but whatever, all those guys, Lenny Fosha, when those guys go, um, it's time to bring in late twenty to or like to middle thirty year olds and start getting fresh, and people will understand what's going on. Uh, because the digital age is taking over podcasts and online listening and streaming and videos and apps, all that's taking over where you're not going to have 60 year olds on apps. You're going to have 20 or 30 year olds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're talking about like, like old, old guard talent that have been the, the heir for 30 plus years, probably going to die in that chair. It's like you're speaking directly about the twin cities market. <laughs> yeah. I don't know the guys there. Are they all in their seventies up there? Well, uh, 70s, I might be stretching it. Late 60s, sure. 60s. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that just gets dry and boring. Like, bring in something fresh. Like, I could get hyped about a subject. I could bring in beautiful women who know sports. Like, these young people, we bring something different to the table. We know mm-hmm. more about the feel of what's going on in the world versus these old guys. And Frances is great, but the fact that he, like, didn't know about Uber until, like, a month ago is just like, come on, man. Like, it's it's stuff that... Sure, we'll laugh at that. We'll laugh at an older guy not knowing something. Yeah. But I think that's something that's so obvious that our younger generation would know. Um, and I think we'll just relate. So the people, the thing is with radio, a lot of people are older. That's that's what's weird. I think we're transitioning mm-hmm. more to podcasts and online listening. But a lot of people in their cars listening to radio do happen to be older and maybe work at home or whatever it may be. So I think we're in the middle of a transition. And within a couple of years, I, I hope and I think, that we will see the transition to younger uh, generation of hosts. No, you're, you're absolutely preaching to the choir here, brother. And it's like, yeah, we're both in the same boat, like uh, younger generation putting in the work, uh, trying just to get that opportunity to bust out. And once oh, it's going to go big. Yeah, I mean, it's it's challenging, and it does get frustrating. I mean, there's times where I said I want to quit, and, I mean, I'm, I've been doing four or five years, and I'm still not anywhere near where I want to be. So it does get frustrating, but... If you believe in yourself and you're confident, a little cocky, 
you could be a little arrogant as long as you're good and and you really trust i hate to say trust the process uh <laughs> good things will come and it, it's it's long man i mean it takes i mean you know it takes it takes a while of podcasting and, and little mm. guest things guest shows and and building up your reel and resume and all that and then finally one day someone's going to recognize you and i think i'm i'm highly confident that within a couple of months someone is going to take that chance um to get me to the next level and, and other other people our age uh <laughs> last little aside uh have you ever have you gotten recognized in public yet um recognized in public uh not really, maybe like once or twice, but I'm I'm not really well known, so I don't yeah. expect to get. I would be pretty hyped if I was recognized, uh, but hopefully in the next year that happens. But by someone I did not know, uh, not really. I mean, there's been times I've said, "Hey, mm-hmm. like, did you hear about that story?" And I have with my interview or, or something like that. Or I had a time, excuse me, when a friend of mine in Connecticut told me, uh. Did you guys did you guys hear about a potential Keenan and Kel reunion it might be happening? And my friend said, "Hey, that was my friend Jake's interview." And something like that happened, mm-hmm. but never like someone in the street like, "Oh, are you Jake Brown for the Jake Brown show?" That <laughs> never happened. Well, I, I think it's because you're the you know average looking twenty six year old white guy, a little bit more on the handsome side. I'll give you credit there in, in a very large city. Right. Where I was going to say, don't don't say too average, bro. You have to throw <laughs> handsome in there. I, I put slightly above average. Uh, whereas me, smaller market, uh, not too many Asian guys over here. So I, I've gotten recognized a couple times. The most recent was I, I was getting new tires done uh, at this tire place. He's like, "Hey man, uh, love your Vikings content, love the show, etc." I was like, "Oh, that's cool." So. Can I get a discount? He's like, yeah, uh, nah. So I'm like, oh, I'm not quite, <laughs> not quite on that level yet, but I'm leveling up. <laughs> yeah, no, well, that's cool, and that's I think what's good about the smaller market is mm-hmm. that you have that chance to be recognized, and I'm sure that is a cool feeling. But yeah, as you said, New York, like I'm, I'm just your average Joe walking mm-hmm. around. People don't really know. So, oh. hey, maybe I go to a smaller market and I, I hit the bar, and there's ladies all over me. Yeah, they're they're as long as it's not Green Bay or like Appleton. It's like no, nah, you don't want that. Yeah, I'll, I'll pass on. No, that. It, you know, it's like um, uh, that thing about prison or high school is like prison. It's like the sex you want, you ain't getting. The sex you get, and you ain't, you don't want. What who's what rapper is that? No, nah, it's from a movie. I forget which one it was. Now nah, I'll figure it out. I'll let you know. Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jake, uh, follow him on Twitter at Jake Brown Radio, CBS Sports Radio. Baby. Hey. I, I love you. You're a fellow hustler. I'm rooting for you. And uh, n- next time you're in the Twin Cities, we're getting together. We're getting drunk. Yeah, and next time, if you're ever in the city, of course, we'll, we'll hit a Met game and uh, we'll take out the town and make sure you bring a couple extra bucks because our beers aren't as cheap as they're in Minnesota. Yeah, yeah I, I'm all for it, man. Hey, appreciate you coming on. All right, man. Good talking to you. And great stuff from Jake. Like, um, you can tell. And uh, I always like knowing what's next. You can always tell whether it be actors that have, actors or actresses that have small roles that in a couple years you know that they're going to be big stars. You get that with Jake. You know that eventually Jake is going to be like a Mike and Mike, like a uh, Gottlieb, like a... Dan Patrick down the line. Yeah, and it, it is cool. I, I like being in the middle of this industry, and you get to rub elbows with the next generation. Like, I do it every week uh, with Zach Bennett, Luke uh, Inman, and Arif Hassan. Like, eventually down the line, those guys are going to be crushers. And I, I'm. It, it's really my honor just to be involved with those guys. Jake Brown is uh, from the same cloth as well. It's like when you see the young seventh-round pick backup quarterback who moves up from third string back up eventually gets his his time to shine and then he goes tom brady on the bed mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's gonna be good uh also someone's time to shine josh pelto remax referred baby just had him on the show this week had a long conversation about real estate in the twin cities it, it's something that really interests me and there there's a lot of um there's a lot of ups and downs, and each market is different. Buyer's market, seller's market that we're in right now, and Josh can help you out whether you're buying or selling. He'll help you navigate and get a good price either way, whichever side of the fence that you're going on. And also, 
he maintains communication. And I can tell you, as someone who went through two realtors before uh, we found the one that bought our house, communication is key. And this is the biggest purchase of your life. You want someone who's going to help you through it and actually return phone calls and emails. Josh will do that. Give him a call, 763-213-4617. One more time, 763-213-4617. Or visit his site, joshpelto.com. Josh Pelto, Remax Preferred. All right, we're out of here. It's uh, we're on Friday. Uh, it, uh, iTunes, uh, Stitcher iHeartRadio, YouTube, and BullShow.co is the website, and all the other various social media. The Twitter, the Instagram, the Snapchat is all at Andy Carlson Show. And if you enjoy us, tell a friend, spread the word, add to the Jerome Homa Army. But thanks, producer Ali Sorensen, for making me not sound so stupid today. For Jake Jerome Brown, there we go. I'm Andy Carlson saying, and you sign our and bye bye. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Listening to Bull with Andy Carlson, Minnesota's 87th best daily podcast. Download the show on iTunes. Everyone's middle name is Jerome.